You're listening to that gets my goat. You should know better. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich, uh, and this is Rich Outfield. <laughs> Sounds like Rich is having a little trouble. Uh, we are coming to you live, but not really live because this is on tape. But we're coming to you sort of live, quasi live, on our uh, regularly scheduled walk. Although we can't really say it's regularly scheduled because we haven't been on one in about four or five months. This is. Because it was been, you know, the road we go has been unpassable. Inpa- impassable? What's the word? Impassable, yes. Okay, impassable. This is the first exercise I've done in months, I believe, hence the uh, heavy breathing. Yeah, it's the first walk of spring. Spring, uh, I guess it started last week sometime, right? Technically, but I, there was a snowstorm on the first day of spring here. So <laughs> spring is when we say it is. Yeah, that's true. It's funny, not too long ago, when I was out running, I'd actually just finished running, and I was standing there stretching. I used the uh, step coming off of my porch as a way to stretch my calves, because then I can drop my heel down real low and stretch it pretty good. And I was standing there, kind of holding on to the porch post, and uh, stretching, and I looked down. But wait, for our female listeners, maybe you should describe what you were wearing. (laughs) Oh, I was wearing a beautiful little number. No, I was uh, stretching and I looked down and there was a tulip. It was coming up out of the ground. It was just a little spiral of the leaves just barely poking through and I was so stoked to see this. It's just like, spring is finally here and I was so excited because this winter freaking sucks. <laughs> I mean, do you agree? (laughs) Well, every winter sucks for me, but yes, this one was particularly cold and drawn out. And remember when we went to Las Vegas in January and it was in the, it was in the single digits, like at at the warmest part of the day. Yeah. And then we got to Las Vegas and it was beautiful. It was like 55, 60 degrees. And we're just like, ah, wow, it's spring here already. But that's winter in Las Vegas. Uh, You can hear... Our feet, we've now made it to the dirt road. This was the impassable road, covered with snow all winter long. And now we're able to just walk it leisurely. We've made it a tradition that we would podcast for a little while, then we'd do a walk. We'd take a walk around the blocks. Around, did we, we measured it one time. How far is it? I think it was about two miles. A little bit more than two miles. I think it might be like two and a half. And you run farther than that pretty much every morning now because you're gearing up for a marathon. Yeah, I actually ran three miles this morning, so I'm going to add now two miles onto that and it'll be a five-mile day. But for me, sometimes it's the only exercise I'll get all week. (laughs) And there's something invigorating about it. There's something... Well, I mean, we talk the whole time. It's not like we're running or trying to exercise in any way. It's just socializing out in the weather. And there's always tons of stars out here because you live in a place that's mostly undeveloped. And when your house was first built, it was way undeveloped. And you can always see way more stars here than you can in the city. Sometimes there's a huge moon like there is right now. It's got fairy rings around it. And what we're passing, can you hear me out of breath already? (laughs) I think it's just talking. Yeah, talking and walking is tough. But there's a, a hill right next to us that we're passing right now. And a few times when the moon has been particularly bright, we'll come out here at night and climb the hill. And one night you took your your device and we went up on, on the hill where they say there are cougars, <laughs> and not, but not the good kind. And we listened to somebody's production of a story. What was it? I don't remember which story it was. It was a, story story. It was. a very alien-esque. In that case, then, it was a uh, dark detour. It was Dark Detour. That Oh, that was a cool story. And it was a great environment to listen to it. Yeah, you get a really nice view at the top of the hill. You, you sit up there and you have a great view of the lake, which is out uh, across the valley. And then there's mountains up on the other side of the valley. And with the full moon, you get the wonderful reflection of the full moon across it. And of course, there's the, the lights of the actual city part of the area across the way that you can see when you're up there really good. So it was really nice and always so romantic. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, it's also evocative. I mean, it was a, a, a scary story we were listening to, and somebody had produced it, and it had been weeks or months since we had recorded it, so a lot of it was new. And I think that we had talked in the past about, wouldn't it be fun if we could podcast out here while we're taking our walk, or, or let's climb to the top of the hill and record sometime, but we'd never been able to until today. Well, well, tell people about this device you've got here. Okay, this is uh, a Zoom H1, which is not the disease, which is the H1N1, but this is the Zoom H1. I'm not sure what the heck H1 stands for, but yeah, it's it's a little device that I got. I started doing the ankle cast um, using my tablet, and my tablet, uh, maybe I'm just stupid and I don't know how to do it, but I did look on the internet trying to find a way to be able to use an actual mic with my tablet. And I was unable to. It's something that wasn't available apparently on uh, Android platform yet. And so, yeah, I had to just use the built-in microphone for it. And, God, the sound was just awful. It was really, really, really loud well, uh, background were, noise. Plus you were driving, you could hear the engine, you know, that sort of thing. You could hear you farting. Right. Okay, you couldn't hear you farting. You could, probably. Well, no, you probably couldn't, because all the other noise would have drowned it out. But yeah, it, it was really awful loud. And so I wanted to find some way to improve that. And while we were at the New Media Expo, several of the folks that were there had some sort of Zoom that they used. We actually recorded Wedded Bliss using that. I think Abby has a Zoom H2. I think it may have even been an H2N. I think that may have where we got the H1N1 joke from. But anyways, uh, she had an H2 something or other, and we used that to record stuff on. And I think... Uh, Renee had some sort of other Zoom as well. And so I thought, you know what? Maybe I ought to check into that. Because you could record, you know, full wave sound. It sounded great. And yeah, so I, I decided I'd get myself one. And we could use it for lots of stuff. We've talked how a lot of times about doing something like this or maybe just bringing a setup with us. And, we, you know, we always mention our little pre-game meal that we have at the little Wendy's or wherever we wind up going the, Five Guys or the in and out or something. And uh, we thought it would be cool. And I was just saying it would be fun to Rish today if we just brought that thing down, brought the Zoom over and t sat there in the middle of some restaurant <laughs> talking on the uh, microphones. And just it would be fun just to see the, the looks that everybody would give us as they're like, what are these guys doing over there? As we did a freaking remote show from the lobby of the local Wendy's or whatever. Um, but yeah, I always thought that would be fun. And you know, we, we did our, that gets my goats on the go on our way to the new media expo. And it kind of, I guess, lighted the fire, lit the fire, sorry, lit the fire in doing something like this in me to where I decided we'd go for it. So I got this uh, Zoom to record with and I even got a lav mic which I broke the clip on today. I'm so irritated. But I got a lav mic that I can clip on and do my ankle cast driving hands-free that way, which I've heard is safe. And yeah, so we've got this, and here we are doing our first podcast as we walk. Do our, our daily walk. <laughs> weekly walk, I guess is a better word. Yeah, for, for me it's weekly. I try to... I don't try to exercise. I was, was going to lie really big there, but I couldn't sell it. <laughs> but I, I do enjoy these walks just because you're out in the country. And besides the, the moon... And Which the is city, making it bright as day right now. Look moly, at this. Yeah. It's amazing. If we, we could probably shoot a movie <laughs> in this light. It's amazingly bright. I could do sign language and you could read my shadows. Yeah. Uh, but another thing that we experience on these walks is we'll see shooting stars out here because there are no street lights on this road. It's not even a paved road. We're out in the middle of nowhere and right now we're at the highest point we get to in our walk. And the nearest house is a half mile away, I would say. Yeah, So we like can that. be loud or do whatever we want right at this point. And lots of times we'll stop right here where we are and we'll watch the sky and we'll see shooting stars. And in, in the city, 
you know, because there's light pollution, I don't see shooting stars anymore. And, and that's something, it's so weird. The first time I ever knew what a shooting star was, was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There's the moment where Short Round and Indy are looking at this scrap on a, a hill, you know, that's like talking about the Shankara stones. And you see this thing that looks like a jet or something like that go over the night sky. And I was like, what the heck is that, mom? Or, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, well, that's a falling star. How have you never seen one before? <laughs> Yeah, you grew up in a freaking little farm town. There should have been plenty to see, right? Yeah, except for I was terrified of monsters, so maybe I wouldn't go out at ah. night. But, uh, I, you know, I was also the oldest, so I didn't have older brothers and sisters that say, hey, there's going to be a meteor shower or any of that stuff. Uh, let's go look at it. But when I lived in L.A., there was there was one day, one night when there was supposed to be the biggest meteor shower in like 10 years. So a couple of friends and, and I, we all loaded up in their car and we had to drive an hour, you know, up into the mountains outside of LA to get to a point where it was kind of like this and it was quiet. And the only people around were other people there to see the meteor shower and somebody in a pickup truck, like a quarter of a mile away, put in the CD <laughs> of Danny Elfman's score for Mars attacks, which is all done on a theremin. <laughs> And they cranked it up, and we all just watched the, the the meteor shower, listening to that music. And it was, oh, it was so magical. And the, the two guys I were with were, like, completely drunk and stoned. And so I, I think they saw a different light show than I did. But even so, even sober as the designated driver, which is, I'm sure is the only reason they let me come with them, it was just, oh, wow, this is amazing. You know, there was something so magical about it. And, yeah, the only time I see shooting stars are with you. <laughs> Yeah, we do see a lot. I I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're always out doing this in the friggin' middle of the night. Because that always seems to be the ideal time. Like, once a year, I think we have the Perseid meteor shower or something like that. I think it's once a year or, or close to it where they have that. And, uh, yeah, it's always two between 2 and 3 in the morning or something like that is the best time to see the falling stars and so that's usually about the time you're heading home so we'll be standing outside as i'm saying goodbye and standing there by your car and go oh there's a shooting star oh hey there goes another one and we'll see a bunch at that time but we'll even see them when there's no percy at around uh fairly often are there meteorites every single night of the year i have no idea man i wouldn't be surprised if there are but well, you went to college. I mean, you didn't have like a useless major or anything, did you? Uh, it turns out I did. You know what's funny, though? In college, I took an astronomy class. But yeah, I have no idea about the meteors and how often they come. Yep. I'm sure there's probably one somewhere in the world at least once a day, but <laughs> I don't know. But see, my uh, my college astronomy class was, all right, everyone open the book of Genesis. <laughs> in the beginning, the, I, I've seen... Shooting stars. I mean, if you count Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, uh, we're going on 30 years now that I've have known that meteorites existed, that shooting falling stars, as I called them as a kid, existed, and it, they've never gotten old. All these years later, I still, it's a, ooh, and there's a lot of things that used to thrill me as a kid, or even as like a, a teen or a 20-something, like fireworks and stuff, don't really thrill me all that much anymore. But for some reason, falling stars are still magical. They're still like, wow, I want to clap. Like when you do watch a fireworks display and the particularly good ones, everybody. So Fun Dip doesn't have the same magic as it used to for you? Is, is, is that a chewing tobacco reference? What, what is Fun Dip? <laughs> fun Dip for those little things where you had the little the candy stick that came with it. And then you licked the stick and you put it in and there was like the Kool-Aid kind of thing in the three different pouches of the different flavors. And you put it in there and then you lick it off and you put it in and you keep... That is revolting, man. Yes, I remember that now. And, <laughs> and I've decided we're going to have to call this episode the Shooting Stars and Fun Dip. But, wow, that's just so gross. I couldn't eat one of those now. Yeah? Or this what about, like, what about here, Pixie here's, Sticks? Here's a bag of sugar. Eat it. <laughs> what about Pixie Sticks? That was a no, straw full of sugar. That stuff is disgusting, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't have the same magic for you anymore, huh? Hmm, I, I don't funny. think so. It's funny because... <laughs> We uh, we had no agenda for what we were going to talk about on this trip. And I just said, well, just start it recording and we'll talk about whatever comes to mind. 
And there are a lot of things that are still as magical for me as a grown-up, as whatever the hell I am, as they were for me as a child. And then there are some things that they just, yeah, that's not, that's not the thing for me anymore. And candy, for the most part, has kind of gone away for me. I mean, I, I, I love salty things like Doritos or French fries and all that stuff. But the candy, I guess I associate that with childhood. I don't know. It just, it's not a, it's not a, a thing that, that it's amazing to me anymore. I wish I could say that was the same case for me. Unfortunately, I eat far too much chocolate. I guess candy candy is not, you know, it's funny. That's one of those things like my kids, as the, when they're younger, they start out and they're like all excited about just like a lollipop or the kind of hard candy that you, you dig on or, or the, I don't know, the fruit flavored kind of Skittles or something like that. And they never... It takes them a long time till they're much older before they start to appreciate the kind of things that more people appreciate, like the peanut butter chocolate, you know, Reese's or a Snickers or, you know, something like that. They don't appreciate it until they get older and they're all like, oh, yay, Tootsie Rolls are just some of the more revolting candy that's wait, wait, out there. Do you like Tootsie Rolls now as an adult? No, okay, no one okay. likes them as an adult. Just, what, what about brown cow? Do they still make that? I don't know. I, I make one of those every day, usually <laughs> in the bathroom. But I don't... Every day? <laughs> Holy moly. Well, I eat every day. I'm going to have to eliminate it, right? See, that's not something that I don't understand. For me, it's like twice a week I have to do that. Uh, well, you might want to eat a vegetable now and then. <laughs> what are these vegetable tools you talk about? The I... fruit and two vegetables. <laughs> You're mocking me, aren't you? The, uh, the, the other thing that I never got to experience as a child is I never got to experience five minutes in heaven. Did you get to do that as a kid? I don't know if I ever did. You know, it's funny... There was a time when I was in junior high and I had a girlfriend, and I make the air quotes for that. And because... you said it with a, a pseudo French accent, too, oh, so that makes I? it more, <laughs> that makes it dirtier somehow. Yes, once I had a girlfriend. A girlfriend. No, I had this girlfriend, but again, quote marks in the air because this was seventh grade, and so I don't, I don't know if I actually even held her hand. But she was my... I was going with her. You know how you asked somebody to go with you. Um, but yeah, it was... And I also at the same time had a best friend. Who was a girl? Not a girl. Oh, okay. And so th this came in... Th these two came in, uh, in conflict one time where uh, it was a minimum day. So, you know, you went to school for... Wait, wait, I, I don't know what that, what's, what is minimum day? I never had middle school. I still don't know what that is. And what is a minimum day? Okay, this was in middle school. <laughs> we had a minimum day, which is, it's one of those things where like, they have certain number of days that they have to go to school a year kind of a thing. Like you must go to school for 240 days every year. But I guess here and there they get away with really shortened days and still calling them a day of school or something basically you're like each period instead of being an hour was like 20 minutes or something so you were done with school by before noon and you got off at like 11 30 and all the kids wanted to go like hang out and do something fun and on this particular minimum day when i had this girlfriend um <laughs> she wanted to go and do something together with the people that were friends with her and and sort of friends with me and then i had my best friend who wanted to go and do something he wanted to do one thing she wanted to do another thing and in the end i figured it was bros before hoes and so i went with my best friend to do something and uh I later heard from another friend of mine that went with them that, you know, they went and they did some stuff and then they went to somebody's house and they did this five minutes in heaven. Is that what it's called? What is it really called? I, I see. I, that's a science fiction term. It's like light speed or something. <laughs> I, I vaguely know what it is. I think it was called. I don't know what it was called. But anyways, it's one of those things where they like spin the bottle or whatever. And then like you go in the closet together. And uh, yeah, so my friend and my girlfriend... Like went not, in together? They went in together. This guy was... He, he later became a really good friend of mine, but at this time we were still just starting to become friends. But yeah, he went in and they were just like, well, this is kind of stupid because 
you, you know, you're like my friend's girlfriend, so obviously I'm not going to, like, molest you in here or anything. And they were in there, and then they, you know, came back out, and they're like, oh, wait, wait, we haven't even got our clothes off yet. Oh, stupid. Um, so, yeah, that was the closest I ever got to five minutes in heaven. I could have done five minutes in heaven even with my girlfriend probably maybe but. it's two minutes in heaven that seems more reasonable yeah it's probably although <laughs> as a kid two minutes is enough um the, that's true by two minutes you've already gone in your pants see the thing is uh, you and i dated the same girl in college and when i went out with her they called her jennifer the prude and then when you went out with her, she was slutty Jenny. And I, 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 I never really understood how that worked. And, and I, it didn't really destroy our friendship, but it seems like that sort of thing would destroy <laughs> your friendship. No, it didn't. Back in those days, girlfriends were friends. A dime a dozen. They were just friends. You, didn't, you were too stupid and little to even know what you're supposed to do. And you're too afraid to dare to try and even kiss the girl, much less even hold her hand. Cut to Rish Outfield, 2013. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I I think I went out with this girl. She was my girlfriend. I was going with her for all of two weeks or something like that. So it's hard for that to kill a friendship. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That was the closest I ever got to the five minutes in heaven. Um, I don't know what else there was. 21 seconds in heaven before she runs out screaming. That was my experience. <laughs> she strangely called it 21 seconds in hell. I don't <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how you the know, name got changed. You know me so well. Oh, did you hear that dog, by the way? It was going freaking crazy at us speaking at less than a whisper <laughs> as we were walking through the neighborhood. We've actually reached the uh, the whispering point of our tour yeah this is the neighborhood not too far from now will be that house where the guy came out standing on his porch and he told us to keep it down as we walked past i'm trying to remember what it was and uh, yeah we we had a big laugh at that because he was a scumbag and a wife beater and he he had blood all over his hands and stuff and he was in, in the midst of crystal meth production but he still told us you know to watch ourselves yeah, the funny thing was that we were silent for, like, the next mile of our, <laughs> our walk, but whatever. See, now I'm going quiet just remembering that. But you're in suburbia right now, and I, was any of this here when you moved in? Uh, I think most of this stuff on this side was, but over back close to my house, none of it was. It's all filled in, and... Uh, you know, the, the houses go way across the way, and that used to all just be a big freaking dust bowl of uh, nothing, tumbleweeds and stuff. Well, see, this part of, of your town is so attractive to me. But not attractive to me as a 30-something, but attractive to me as a kid. And when I would see sh movies like Poltergeist or E.T. of this idea of suburbia, I was like, oh, that's what I want. Because growing up in farmland, where everybody has several acres and your nearest neighbor is a bike right away, rather than, oh, I'm just going to take a walk over there. I, I don't want to say it's lone, it was lonely, even though it was, but it's just there's something so spread out and not intimate, not, gosh, what's the word? Not together, uh, not community. Yeah, it's, it's much less communal, where, where you share a yard with your neighbors, which I know can be a bad thing, but it's just so much more of a, of a neighborhood. You know, like lots of times I will watch old movies and I'll see that they shot on the Universal back lot. There was this flick called, uh, I want to say it was called Leave, Leave Her to Heaven that was made in the 50s. And it had, uh, I think, Jane Wyman and Rock Hudson in it. And they shot it just right there where they shot Back to the Future with the, the town square, you know, the Hill Valley and all that stuff, as it was in the 50s. And... To me, there was something so phony about that, about, you know, these houses that close together, you know, and that perfect and, and all that. But that's what suburbia is here. I mean, there, I don't know why they have to be so close. <laughs> because, because you can cram in more houses and get more <laughs> money out of it that way. That's why they put them so close. But uh, when I was a little, little kid... We lived in La Mirada, California, which is just right there next to Anaheim. And I guess had I stayed there, I would have experienced that 
suburbia 5k hell what uh, sorry so that suburbia experience <laughs> from the movies <laughs> and uh, lots of times you know i think about things like that i think about oh if only I had had a different upbringing or, or if only my uncle had lived because he was all into movies and, you know, wanted to indoctrinate me into the things that I didn't know about and things like that. I just, you know, I always think about, oh, what would it have been like to grow up in a, t a place like this where maybe there you have seven or eight boys your age in any direction? You know, you could have all gone riding bikes together or played Star Wars together or, you know, two and a half minutes in heaven. <laughs> yeah, that is an interesting thing. I mean, we we talk endlessly about the alternate reality in which the whatever has happened, and, and you know, so our life is that much different. Um, yeah, it, well, Dave, it's really interesting to me. Just to, what if I did this instead back then? If what if I was married to a completely different person, had a completely different family? If we just did it on a different night, now I've got a completely different child. You know, I don't know. It's just weird. Well, see, you, I, I don't know if you have it very good, but you certainly have it better than a lot of people I know. And your kids all seem cool and, and you know, not horrible and, and, and all that stuff. So I, I think that if you got a, a glimpse into an alternate universe where you had different kids or whatever, you would miss your own kids. You'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There was that episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where Worf and Troy had gotten together in an alternate universe, and they had their own kid that's like half Klingon and quarter Beta Z or whatever. And, and, and the whole time he's like, but what about Alexander? What about my son? Alex? And she's like, we don't have a son. And he's just like, but that kid was... That kid was three fourths Klingon. That's way better than than the kid we've got now. <laughs> okay, he didn't actually say that, but I just I like that Worf could be racist because he was a Klingon. You know what I mean? Whereas none of the humans were allowed to be racist. <laughs> anyway, I, the question I was going to ask you was, what was your neighborhood like growing up in Sacramento? Were you actually in the capital city of California, or were you in like some outskirt that had a different name? It was an outskirt. It was a, a suburb of Sacramento. It wasn't downtown. We were in a, a, an area that's called Fair Oaks, which is on the east side of Sacramento. And it was really nice. I don't know. We lived in... It, it was a similar area kind of like this. It was a planned community kind of a place where they'd built a... I'm trying to think of the word for it. It was a prefabricated neighborhood kind of thing. Well, kind of like that. You know, it was a subdivision, I think was the the word I was trying to come up with, where they just, they had a big place and they went through and they put in a bunch of streets and built a bunch of houses all at once and then sold them off, kind of like this place is. But it happened, in, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s when they built all these houses. But yeah, it was really nice. I loved it. You know, I lived on the same street and I lived in the same house my entire life. I never moved until I was an adult. I had a park, a really large park, right over my back fence. And it was an unusual park in that it had, you know, a playground and it had like some baseball diamonds and a big open field that you could play like frisbee or soccer or whatever you wanted to play on it. But then it also had huge open areas and these areas were protected areas. Protected it was by whom? Protected by... By cholos? No. <laughs> protected by the government or whatever. Protected by uh, hippies that wanted to save the, uh, the, the environment. So this area where I lived, it had what was called vernal pools in it. And it was just a, a, a kind of thing that was unusual and it was kind of specific to the area. But anyways, it was just during the winter time when it rained, like dozens and dozens of ponds would fill up in this area and there were streams that would run from one to the next and it was just a huge network of ponds that would fill up in the back of this park and so we would go out and play in this thing all the time we'd get a bunch of rocks and try and build dams and and yeah it was one of those you know we'd go catch frogs and stuff like that that were uh, out in the, in the ponds back there and i loved it i seriously like still you know i wish there was some way that i could have lived there again. There was actually a time shortly after I got married when we were living in Sacramento where the house across the street from me was up for sale and it was like 
a short sale. And so it was going for really cheap. And I was just like, oh man, if only, I don't know, you know, like if, if that happened right now, I might possibly be able to get into that house, might be able to afford it. Of course, 10 years ago, I couldn't afford, you know, the, the one room of it. But, uh, oh man, it would have been so awesome to be able to have my kids grow up on the same street that I grew up on just across the street and have that park right there that they could go to. We actually used to do sometimes, we're talking about damming up the streams, <laughs> for fun, we owned a canoe. And so when it got really bad and, and the rain was really heavy and the, uh, the ponds were getting really full, we would go back there and we'd try and plug the drain because there was like a drain that came out the back end of the park and it was actually right next to my house. So we'd try and plug up the drain to see if we could get it to flood really badly. Because if it flooded enough, we could just take the canoe and go out on the water. I don't know, I, I, I loved doing that every now and then. Usually like once a year it would get bad enough. But the funny thing was my dad, of course, because the drain was right against our property, would always go out there and make sure to clean the drain out so that it didn't flood onto our property. And uh, and so, yeah, it was like me against him. I'd be trying to plug it up, and he'd be trying to clean the drain. So I wanted to go canoeing. If it got plugged enough, you could get your canoe over the sidewalk that went out to the park. Otherwise, you'd have to get up and carry it over. But you could even go on when it was, like, normal depth because the ponds were, like, a good foot deep. And, uh, yeah, the canoe would mostly not hit the bottom. <laughs> See, I can't even really imagine that. We didn't have drains in my town. And I, I guess if it rained a lot, you know, we would, you'd have puddles. And the uh, toads would lay their eggs in the puddles. And you'd have tadpoles. Pollywogs, as we called them. In, yeah, that's in what Hick we called town. them, too. And there were tons of pollywogs in these ponds. And it was really crazy when you get into the deep summer. And the ponds were about to dry up because you'd have just a small amount. And it would just be filled. Just it, the water would be black, and it would be roiling because it was just filled with tadpoles, pollywogs. See, that's amazing to me, and that's one of my fondest memories: is the catching the pollywogs, and we'd put them in a big bucket and just leave it in the backyard. And most of them would die because that's nature's way, but some of them would become little toads. And I, I, there's something about watching a metamorphosis like that. Same thing with you know caterpillars becoming butterflies that shows you the circle of life or shows you something that's not just you know we had a dog and then it got sick and then we buried it <laughs> and it's it's so weird there were so many toads in my little town that you, once you started to drive or, or you know my parents they would drive every time you would back down the driveway to go somewhere at night you would crush one of those and you'd find it the next morning squashed and 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 i you know that there you go the circle of life again but <laughs> we're in 2013 now yeah and those don't exist anymore in my little town and they're on the endangered species list uh we went to you backed over too many of them man jeez <laughs> there was something so sad about that because again i don't feel like i'm that old but to have lived to see the end of those. Now, granted, they're not extinct or anything like that, but... We, but I, they were plentiful. They were everywhere, and now they're not. Yeah. And, and my little town is so similar to the way it used to be. It's not like there has been urban development that has wiped them out. Like, there was a, a frog in Las Vegas that I, I just read about this week that went extinct in 1966 because they were... They were uh, what, did you, what do you call what... Pandas are to China, or koalas are to Australia. You mean like that they only were there? Yeah. Well, I'll just say that they they were unique yeah, to the works. they to the meadows in in Vegas. The, uh, the now they're they're all gone. There's none left. They went extinct in 1966, and that oh geez, that's such a weird thought. Whenever somebody tells you that let's say a thousand species go extinct in the rainforest every month or whatever. I mean, it's always some number where you're just like, holy crap, give me a gun to put in my mouth. But to know that just, you know, so recently something no longer exists. And we went to this prehistory museum this week. I guess it was last week now. And they had this big wall with photos 
of animals that have gone extinct since the advent of the camera. You know, I mean, the photographs of these animals, and then it talks about when they went extinct, and there was something just heartbreaking about it for me. And I could have just stood there for <laughs> an hour looking at all these animals that no longer exist and feeling, I guess it made me feel small or made me feel petty as a, a species. But the rest of the museum was filled with skeletons from animals that existed millions of years ago. Or, you know, the most recent animals in there had been, you know, like 10,000 years when the Smilodon went extinct. 10,000 is so recent in the history of this planet that it just, uh, that made me feel insignificant beyond belief. That made me insignificant as a species, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even though we've done more destruction than all the other species could have, it's just like, wow, holy crap. And there was, there were, at the very end of the exhibit, there was a mammoth, a woolly mammoth skeleton and a bunch of skeletons of Homo sapiens that hunted the woolly mammoth. And they all had like spears and one of them had a huge rock and they were all trying to take down this skeletal mammoth. And oh my, it was so big. It was the size of a double decker bus in through London. You know what I mean? It made an elephant look like nothing. And to see that th those were us, we could have bred with them. You know what I mean? You have even. <laughs> Not the mammoths, but the, the skeletons of the human beings. Uh, like, you say human beings? Of, of, of us. And I, anyhow, it just that sort of thing. The, the idea of a million years or 10 million years and all these different periods and species that have evolved into things that we know today, but this is what they were once like. And, you know, the, the teeny tiny little horses or the teeny tiny little elephants or, or conversely, the gigantic, you know, the megalodon shark that is, is bigger than anything I could even conceive of. That made me feel like, wow, the history is amazing. I, I recaptured some of that amazement that I had as a kid, that all boys have, when looking at a dinosaur book or, oh, you know, finding out their names. And this means thunder lizard, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this means tyrant king. Boy, I'm just talking and talking. Sorry, man. But sometimes coming out here and looking at nature and looking at the mountains or looking at the sky or the moon it makes you feel closer to the past or closer to the history of the area around us. And when you get into some place like this, that's not all that developed, you know, it's like, how different is this area than it would have been a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago? You know, that, I don't know. There's something amazing about that. I mean, it makes me think that maybe I could have been a history teacher or I could have been an archeologist or I could have been a contender instead of a bum, which is what I am. Marshall Latham ran a, a story on uh, the Journey Into podcast uh, called Knock. It was an, one of those old time science fiction stories, but these aliens come and they conquer Earth and they have no concept of death. They're immortal beings. And the one that he calls George that he sort of becomes friendly with, or at least he communicates with, is really, really young. And it's 7,000 years old. And I, for some reason, that really stuck with me, that 7,000 is young. And if you lived forever, when would you not be young? Because <laughs> it's so much easier to say, I was born a million years ago, but I'm going to live forever. <laughs> yeah. So you're still young. A million years old. You're like the turtle on uh, Finding Nemo. 400 years or Does he say 200? Or 400? I can't remember. Still young, man. <laughs> Wait, was there somebody famous that did the voice of that? Oh, see, no. Pixar doesn't have to do that. Huh? Yeah, they don't do that. Although it could have been Chong, or Cheech. No, Chong. Yeah, Sounds like Chong. Chong a lot. <laughs> well, I, I'm assuming you were into dinosaurs as a kid because you were male. <laughs> And alive. Have you ever seen that dinosaur museum walk, walk through it? You know, my family has gone to it several times, but it's always been on a day when I was at work, so I have never been able to go to that. Well, see, I, I went with my nephew's preschool class. <laughs> and honestly, a bunch of four-year-olds and five-year-olds, they're too young for that sort of thing. To, to understand what they're looking at. And, I mean, even to have somebody 
read to them the sign and say, you know, this is a Triceratops and this is when it lived and this is what Triceratops means, etc., etc. And here's a representation of what it would have looked like with skin. That's not just something not for the littlest kids, which are four. It, but it's, it's something, I, I know that it made a much bigger impact on me to see an actual brachiosaur skeleton that just dwarfed us as fat as you and I have become. <laughs> it's just like, wow, it's insane that something this big could have been alive. And <laughs> stayed up. I mean, they're gigantic. How did they even support all that weight? And I, the biggest thing we've got on the earth now is whales. But I mean, when will you ever see a blue whale? <laughs> Never. Yeah, you don't you don't get to see whales because they're in the water. I mean, the biggest land animal is an elephant, and that's tiny compared to a blue whale. But uh, this, I don't know. There, there was that was a, a kind of a magical trip for me, and I know I got a heck of a lot more out of it than the kids did. But just as a glimpse into history and a glimpse of a million years. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine a hundred years. That's something that they say about Americans is we think that a hundred years is really something. And people from other parts of the world think that a <laughs> hundred miles is really something because they live in small places that are very, very old, whereas we live the opposite. Yeah, that's, uh, that's that, that joke that you always hear. Because, shoot, I mean, you and I have gone on road trips to San Diego, to Denver, to other places... And yeah, it takes forever to drive to all the way to Las Vegas or wherever, you know. And, you know, people in Europe, they just, they hop on the, the tube and uh, they're there an hour later or whatever. And it's a completely different country. I'm sure most people that live over there on the, uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere, you know, before the time that they're like 10 years old, they've probably visited 10, 15 countries. Whereas you and I... We, <laughs> you know, I've been to, I think, four countries, counting the United States in all my life. And you've traveled more extensively, I think, than most people. I, or at least I, I can imagine. I mean, you've been in a different country in the last year. True. Yeah, I, I, I get off to Canada a lot of times. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the... I've been to Canada, Mexico, which are the two countries that we border. And then uh, I've traveled to one other country besides... When we did the uh, the All the Cool Monsters at Once episode, did we talk about Bigfoot afterward? Or Nessie or any of those things? I, I don't remember. I don't either. It's been too long. But they had uh, like a skeleton of, gosh, I, I want to say they were called Archerons or something like that. They were the giant sea turtles. And it was bigger than a Volkswagen Beetle, you know, this sea turtle. You and I could easily have sat astride its back. And the fact that these don't exist, but they did exist is so mind-boggling to me. And they had, like, a little bit of... Like, they had a skull, I think, of a plesiosaur, which is what people speculated that Nessie was. And part of me was... I, I've always felt this way, but I really am feeling it this week. It's just wishing, wishing that somebody would prove con conclusively that the Loch Ness Monster exists. And it's like, and we can study this thing that should be long gone. You know, it's the opposite of extinction. <laughs> you know, the opposite of what happens in the rainforest every single day happened with this animal. <laughs> well, that kind of stuff does happen on occasion where somebody will be out fishing and they pull up this fish and they're just like, what the crap is this? And they'll bring it back and people will look at it and they'll be like, that's a ichthyophars camp. Yeah, and, and, and it's this fish that they thought has been extinct for 10,000 years or more. And it turns out, no, they're still down there. Well, what if that was the last one? I mean, it would be so tempting <laughs> to take it back and show all your friends. And it's like, but what if? If it was the last one, then when it died, they're all gone anyways. I, I hear it's you. It's got to have at least two for it to keep going. <laughs> See, but I don't want somebody to find Bigfoot's bones. I don't want somebody to say, oh, we finally found Nessie. We found her skeleton at the bottom of the lock. I love the idea that she still exists and she's still fertile. And she's not even she. She's one of many of these creatures and stuff. Just, I don't know why it's so amazing to me, but just, well, the unknown. That was something we had to have talked about in all the cool monsters at once, is not knowing about something and, and wondering what if and all that is just, 
that's one of the best things about having a human mind or a creative mind. I don't know if all humans wonder what if. Yeah, that, that's one of those things that I really enjoy. It was funny right before you showed up today, I was down helping my daughter. She had written a story. They do this thing at her school where they write a story and then they illustrate it. And then they send it off to some company. That publishes it? Which binds it together and makes a book out of it. And then they send it back to you. And you are a published author now. (laughs) She's better than us. And so, yeah, I was helping her put together her book. And I was reading through her story. And she actually does this on on, on occasion. She'll just sit down and write a story when she's bored. And they're always really crazy. There's uh, often mad scientists and monsters and things like that involved kind of stuff I guess she digs on. I guess maybe she'll wind up being a sci-fi writer when she grows up. But I, I love that. I love that that's something that she's interested in. That's something that she finds fun and she'll do that just for fun sometimes. I mean that's kind of like what I was like as a kid. So maybe she will be that way but it's cool to see the creativeness, the imagination passing down. It's one of those things where uh, I remember seeing a, a thing where they were talking about just children Like, they surveyed a bunch of children and asked them how many of them consider themselves creative. And, you know, it was like 90% of kids think they're creative when they're like 8 or under. And then they do the same thing to like teenagers at like 16 and it's all the way down to like 30% or less, you know. It's just something that I don't know if we just grow out of or it's beaten out of us or, you know, we're told that we need to do something useful with our lives and give up on these silly things. And so we learn to become an auto mechanic or, or something else. But, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's funny because it's hard to say whether it's a good or a bad thing. But wait, wait, once they reach adulthood, how many are left? Uh, I thought that's where you were building toward. I'm sure it goes down a little bit more, probably down to like 15% or less, I don't know. But uh, yeah, there's just a steep decline as it goes on. It's hard to say whether that's a good or a bad thing, (laughs) because being someone who has a creative, you know, a a passion for creative things, it's hard to turn that into a living. I've got a job that's sort of creative, sort of uses those things, but, you know, there's only so much, it seems like there's only so much room for creative people out there. You know, they have so many film directors and so many, you know, novelists and et cetera. And then, you know, the rest are the, you know, wannabes that never quite make it and they wind up, you know, the the bands that never got signed to the record contract. And so they're playing bars and they're 45 years old and they're still maybe hanging on to it, but they're never gonna turn it into a, you know, a big thing. But maybe that's not important. Maybe just being able to use it as an outlet is just as good. Sometimes, though, I don't know, when the bills mount up and I realize I don't have the money to pay them all, it can be awful frustrating. My car is a piece of crap and I can't afford to fix it. And so every day I just sit into it and pray that it will start. (laughs) And maybe, I don't know, I, I think the real problem is that I don't have the drive. Maybe if I'd written enough things, I could be selling them now on... Smashwords or the Amazon store or whatever, and I'd be fine. I'd be like, no, I got plenty of money to fix the car because I did what I was supposed to do and I wrote. Well, um, it, I've gotten off subject. No, no, it's all right. This is we never had an intended subject on this, but in recording books for Audible, people have you know they self publish whatever they want. I don't know if it even costs anything to publish on Amazon. You just have to provide it and the cover art and it has to pass their quality tests or quality uh, minimums or something like that. But in seeing the the shit <laughs> that people have published and, and ostensibly sold, I mean, maybe they never sold a single copy, but they're available for somebody and a narrator to record an audiobook of. It, it's boggled my mind and it's made me think so many times that you and I need to just sit down and put some of this stuff out as texts and it would be fun to record an audio book of my own but first you'd have to upload a book as an audible as I sorry as an Amazon file for it to show up on audible and all that stuff and these people that I'm reading their auditions not even 
considering sending in an audition for, they did that step that you were just saying. They did the one thing that you and I weren't willing to do, weren't courageous enough to do, weren't motivated enough to do, maybe. Maybe that's it. You you were talking when we very first started this walk about throwing your hat over the wall or throwing your hat in the ring. or Was that a different conversation? I think that may have been the uh, other episode that we recorded right before we left for the walk. There's only so many hours in the day and you're trying to get in shape. You're trying to read. Sorry, you're trying to write. We're both podcasting. We're both trying to make money and all that stuff. And it's just there's so few hours of freedom and you have to decide what are you going to do with these hours. And yeah, what you were saying a minute ago, you know, about how creative we were as children and, you know, how many different things we wanted to try or do or be. And those just get whittled down. And for some people, they get whittled down to nothing. You know, my passion is watching wrestling now, or my passion <laughs> is, I don't know. It, that's sur- my passion now. I, that's what I, what I do instead. <laughs> With surfing the internet or playing a video game or, or, or something, that that's what takes up my free time. Yeah, that is some people's passion. There was one guy I remember I used to work with, and he would watch YouTube videos of people doing Guitar Hero. And he's just like, oh, look at this guy, dude. He's like, he's nailing every note. This guy's friggin' amazing. And I'm just like, wow, you put that much time into learning to play this pretend guitar you could learn to play a real guitar in the amount of time you you worked on playing this freaking little plastic Sesame Street freaking guitar. And he's just like, what would I do with that? What, play shows in some stupid coffee shop? <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess if that's as far as you can imagine, then maybe you're better off with the Elmo guitar. It may be that more people know who that guitar hero champion is than us That's because probably of what true. we do. I mean, their YouTube is, I mean, it's a creative wasteland, but it's also visited by, I mean, that is the mass that's almost replaced television as the popular medium of, of the, the teens. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I mean, you see things like the double rainbow video or whatever, that's got 5 million views. Yeah, that, that, that is kind of crazy. That's another thing we ought to do is make some videos to uh, put onto those places. So then we, people will be like, oh, Big Anklevich. Yeah, I know him. He was the guy that did that Guitar Hero video. <laughs> oh, he does stories too? Wow. There's a million things that we could do. I mean, I, I think we should probably be content. We should be satisfied that we do have creative outlets that we still contribute to. I mean, you and I have both written this week on fiction, you know what I mean? Something that we're not ever going to get paid for. We wrote it just because we're passionate about it. And we're podcasting as we speak. And, and you know, everybody else in this town is asleep right now. <laughs> not anymore since we've walked past them all and woke them. We have to speak up. <laughs> we hope the microphone can pick up the these nuggets of wisdom that are coming from our mouths. All right. Well, uh, we, we've made it back to my house. I, I think we've we, I guess we probably have run our course. I'm sure we could keep going, but uh, this does. This one's going to wind up being longer than our uh, mega show, our 102nd anniversary show. <laughs> Maybe this will be our 11th episode, or the 111th or something. Yeah, the 111st. I is think that, is that what they call it? Yeah, maybe. Who knows what the uh, what we're at? I think we'll be a little bit short of that. Probably It'll be the 11th. <laughs> But it's it's a fun – it was a fun experiment. Let's just talk for our whole trip and then podcast it and see if it's entertaining to anyone. And if it isn't, we still got exercise. Yeah, there you go. It was worth it for us even if it sucked for you. <laughs> Too bad for you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, I guess we're going to sign off and uh, we'll be back with more next time. Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Damn it, good moving. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Boy, they must really think a lot of themselves.